What ho chums, it's your boy, Slacky J. Fights Gone By podcast, coming at you on an expensive podcasting microphone through all the tubes and crystals and whistles that I imagine are in it. Um, and it's Thursday, Thursday the 19th of November. We got fights at the weekend. I thought, uh, let's get together and have a little chat about fights. It's a novel idea. I'm hoping it catches on. Um, but yes, it's the flyweight bonanza this weekend. Uh, we got the male flyweights, or the you know the flyweights you care about, and the Valentina Shevchenko vanity division <laughs> going on, uh, double headlining a card. And then there's some other fights on it. A couple of like, mm, really? And then a few that are like, oh, it's all right. But we'll get into all of that. We're get, it's going to be a short, informal one today because I've just finished my Valentina Shevchenko study. It's called Valentina Shevchenko, The Counterfighter's Curse. It's pretty deep. Uh, and the deal is that because I bought this expensive microphone, you now have to go and read that. I'm sorry. I wish there was something more interesting I could write about, but she's the only person fighting this weekend, except for Devison Figueredo, who is tricky to write about for reasons we'll get into later. Um... But let's just go into this by pointing out how the UFC flyweight division is going at the moment. And uh, UFC flyweight division history is a lot like Russian history. <laughs> Can't remember which historian said it, but Russian history is just can be summed up in the sentence, and then it got worse. Um, the UFC flyweight division, having cut... Well, they didn't cut Demetrius Johnson, they traded Demetrius Johnson. Demetrius Johnson wanted to be traded. It's very complicated. You, know, you can't really be... Oh, oh my God. before we even get into this, Demetrius Johnson weighed in on the GOAT discussion and was like, uh, who, sa who says winning even matters? I would consider Gigard Mukasasi on my GOAT list. <laughs> okay, firstly, clearly Demetrius Johnson, listener of the Fights Gone By podcast, tried to piss me off. But the man whose entire GOAThood stands on him winning a lot, just being like, eh, winning doesn't even matter. I, I like Gegard. My feelies like him, so he's in my pound for pound. Um, but yes, it's not a very goat move to lose a controversial um, decision to Henry Cejudo and then piss off and not give him the chance for a third. I mean, that that's always going to be something that's going to... Whenever Henry Cejudo's fights are brought up, people are always going to be like, well, he won that controversial decision over DJ and they never did a rematch. You're like, well, that's not really Henry Cejudo's fault. He was there. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, they let Demetrius Johnson go to Asia. They traded him for Ben Askren. And I'm not a business person, but it may not have been the best deal in the world. To be fair, they did get Jorge Masvidal's hype run out of it. So they probably made more money in the long run. But... After that, Henry Cejudo was up at bantamweight, didn't go back to flyweight, uh, and then they wanted Joseph Benavides to take over, and Devison Figueredo smashed him. And then in a rare moment of consistency, he smashed him again, because if there's one thing about Devison, Devison Figueredo, it's that he's just all over the place. But for some reason, he was just this on-the-laser-targeted killer in the two Benavides matches, having been just a, a sloppy mess up to that point in his UFC run. Um... And then earlier this week, they cut Juicier Formiga, who has been a long-time staple of the top 10 of the, of the flyweight division. I can't remember the last time he wasn't in the top 10. He's been top 5 forever, basically. A very tricky guy. And um, while he never really... Like, he would always put together two or three wins and then something would come along, like Joseph Benavidez or um, Alex Perez, who we're talking about this weekend, uh, would come along and beat him. But does sort of make a laughing stock of your division. Uh, but I did say, you know, this is consistent with the UFC's treatment of flyweights. Headline a card, a shit card with flyweights, uh, and then during that week, cut a top flyweight. And then when the card sells shit, be like, why don't people like flyweights? <laughs> oh, dear. But at any rate, I will introduce you for me all the best in his future endeavours. Um, but we never did get him versus DJ, so he could always go to one and do that. And um, John Lineker's over there, too. And to be honest, he could just fight Team Lake fighters forever and never lose. Because <laughs> they're always going to give up their back if he tries to take them down. His whole thing is like, shoot, peek out the back, get on the back, choke. Having said that, there's a one card this weekend. Who's that? Bruno Pucci versus Wanil Kwan. Okay. Uh, when is that? Oh, no, that's the last week. Or is that today? No, that's tomorrow. Fuck. Who even knows? There's also an Invicta card. Don't need to talk about that. But... The other one that's happening 
tonight is the Bellator card. Um, you know, by the time you hear this, it's probably already kicking off. So uh, we won't go into it too deep. But the, the interesting part is that uh, Darian Caldwell's fighting AJ McHugh Jr. in the main event. Benson Henderson's going up to uh, welterweight on short notice to fight, fight Jason Jackson. You know, whatevs. Um, Kevin Lee's brother's on it. And Kimbo Slice Jr. You know, there's, there's not a lot you need to care about. But uh, that main event between Darian Caldwell and AJ McKee is pretty exciting. You've got Darian Caldwell, who's just a really gangly dude, but very, very strong wrestler, very, very strong top player. Uh, very limited striker and, and tends to look bad if guys can keep him on the feet and make him struggle. Um, AJ McKee, very good uh, wrestler. Pretty fun on the feet. Think about AJ McKee for the Patreon boys. I think it was before his fight with um, Pat Curran. And that was a good fight, actually. Go go watch that if you've got nothing on. But um, eh, it's not that good. You know, go go watch it if you've got no good fights to watch. Uh, so yes, Darian Caldwell versus AJ McKee is interesting, and that decides who goes forward in the tournament. But otherwise, our focus is this pay per view card that's going to do no buys. Uh, UFC two five five, Figueroa versus Perez. Now, in fairness to Figueroa, you know he's he's a pretty exciting guy. I, I think the thing about him is that he's just uh, there's a lot. It's quite difficult to grab on to what he's good at. Uh, I certainly found that writing about him um, and, and making that, uh, who's it, Devison Figueredo, Joseph Benavides, Filthy Casuals Guide. Um, you know, he's got huge natural power. He's got quite good timing, or very good timing, actually. You know, you can see him, like, pull away from sh- from strikes and duck in on takedowns just from the waist and take people down. It's not good technique. You know, it's just the guy is sharp and, and uh, knows an opening when he sees it. But someone put up a stat that was like, he's got the lowest strikes per knockdown apart from Nganu, which is incredible. Um, and when you see him hit some of these guys at, at flyweight, you know, they, they, he really moves them. Um, and it's quite impressive because a lot of the time when you're talking about smaller punches, you have to um, really throw your weight into it to make up for a lack of weight and, and a lack of muscle mass compared to someone who's like 265 pounds. But he's fighting Alex Perez, and Alex Perez is sort of... Um, Popped up out of nowhere. He came in through the uh, Dana White's Contender Series. So really recent contender, really. Um, beat Jose Torres by um, TKO. And then he ran into Joseph Benavidez, who is still very, very good. You know, <laughs> Even though he got smashed by Figueiredo twice, he's still shit hot. He just can't win a title. Um, and uh, Joey B beat him in round one. But then since then, he's put together three, no, four, no, three. Um, three in a row. Mark De La Rosa, jo- uh, Jordan Espinosa all rhyming, and then Juicy F. Omega, who, yeah, as we said, got cut the other day. Um, but the Juicy F. Omega one was notable because he, he just low-kicked him to death. It was the low, low kick again, and it basically it took about four minutes for him to stop Formiga, but the whole fight was just the commentators going, that low, low kick's changed the world! <laughs> like they do every time the, the low, low, low kick becomes a big part of the fight. Um, but yeah, if you watched him come in through the uh, Contender Series, on the Contender Series, he scores uh, a submission by Anaconda Choke. And then in his first UFC fight, he also scores a submission by, it says Dars Choke here, but I think it was an Anaconda Choke as well. Oh no, he went, he tried to Anaconda Choke him early, but he's really, really good from the front headlock. Um, does a lot of switching between arm in and arm out stuff. And he'll go to the back and then, um, as he's running your back, turn back around and and sit down in front of you in like that seated katagatami and then he'll change that into an anaconda as well uh really very very good uh grappler in that regard so that's quite fun you know if he can um get figueredo off his feet because figueredo is not like that's the whole thing about him figueredo i was going to write a piece uh before i got stuck in with this volunteer thing i was going to write a piece comparing him to dj because while i think dj's um long in the tooth at this point i, I think he's past his best days but he was always um, you know, he was doing everything right. He was never letting people into fights. You know, if they got into a fight, it was because, you know, John Dodson knocked him down or something like that. And, and uh, or you know, someone like um, Henry Cejudo was able to give him a lot of trouble. But he he fought from one exchange to another like his purpose was not to let the opponent do anything to him and him to keep piling out the points and the damage. Um, whereas Devison Figueredo lets dudes hit him and take him down and, and do whatever all the time and it's just like well I'm gonna I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna hit you harder or, or I'll try and roll through and get you in a uh, a, a triangle from the back or whatever <laughs> you know he, he's it, well they call him the god of war but like where a DJ represents like scientific fighting and order Devison Figueredo represents basically chaos <laughs> but it makes for very entertaining fights I like the idea of um 
Perez getting after it, getting after his lead leg early because obviously if you can hit a, a guy in the lead leg a lot, uh, it, it, whether they're like a jabby movie boxer or a um, load up behind the lead shoulder and throw the right hand sort of boxer, if they rely on throwing their hands, they need their legs to do it. If they rely on moving, they need their legs to do it. So it doesn't matter if you're fighting a big banger or a dancer, get after that lead leg early. Um, I'd be very interested to see him pick up single legs and make uh, Figueredo work on one leg, you know, rather than trying to blast through him with doubles and stuff like that. Uh, put him on the fence, make him fight a more technical, grindy fight. Figueredo is a big flyweight, cuts a lot of weight. So, uh, you know, I think fighting a longer, more technical fight is, is a good idea for Perez, rather than trying to hit him hard early and, and opening yourself up to nice counters. But let's talk about the uh, the real main event, which is Valentina Shevchenko versus Jennifer Meyer. Um, yeah, I've just written a load on Valentina Shevchenko. Oh, there's blue tack under my keyboard. Fuck. Um, I've just lit written a load about uh, Valentina Shevchenko. And uh, obviously, go, go read that if you're a Patreon boy. Um, but I was specifically talking about like the idea of Nunes versus Shevchenko 3, because... That is sort of where all this seems to be heading, because otherwise it's a bit directionless. You know, there is this division that they've made for Valentina, but she doesn't have any real challenges because there isn't that depth of talent. You know, anyone who goes up, anyone who's had success at... Basically, it started out as like 125 was where all the people who couldn't put it together at bantamweight or strawweight went. And then as more and more bantamweights and strawweights have like taken a loss... They've moved to the, to the new division. And anyone who's new coming in tends to beat the people who were already there. <laughs> like, uh, Cavillio just came in and beat uh, Jessica Rai and uh, Jess, uh, Jessica Andrade has just gone there. And who did she beat in her last one? Can't remember. But, you know, that's how it goes. It's like, were they an established contender at bantamweight or strawweight? Are they going up? Cool. Like, they're going to be a force in that division because there isn't, like, it was clamoring to make this division because we needed it, but it isn't true at all. And in making the division and, and putting a belt on Valentina Shevchenko, you've taken away the most compelling part of the bantamweight division for Nunes because the, um, the rivalry between them uh, you know, I <laughs> having just studied that fight with the fine tooth comb, the the second one and the first one, to be honest. Um, you know, it it did put uh, it, it dropped a Cleveland steamer on the chest of our ambitions to have that rivalry go on. But you do sort of need the third fight, even even if it's only because there's nothing else going on. But the the second fight was pretty undecisive, and I think there was a lot to learn from it. And I wrote this in the article, but um. Nunes did an amazing job of taking away what Shevchenko does so well. And if you watch a Shevchenko fight, what she does is control the distance really well. And she's she's trying to get people to overextend, but not in like that bouncy in and out way that you see a lot of MMA fighters using. Um, she does it in that very sort of like... The, the thing that you go look at and go, that's Muay Thai. That's Muay Thai, that is. Um, but like they're very twitchy, almost stationary, but actually doing a lot of work to stay on the end of the reach. If you watch someone like... Sanchai, you know, he makes it, or Sanchai, sorry, uh, he makes it look very, very uh, effortless. But if you watch his feet, they're, they're shuffling like a hundred times a minute because he's constantly adjusting that distance to stay just beyond the range of dudes who are bigger than him. And then they swing, he leans back or pulls back, and then he comes back in while they're out of position. And it's very similar with um, Shevchenko. She leaves range, leaves range, leaves range. And then when she thinks, basically the only time you're going to get close enough to try and hit her is because she wants you to, and that's when she drops the, the check hook on your face. Uh, sometimes come to the left hook afterwards, but most of the time it's just like point scoring and leaving. Or she might, you know, she'll hit you with the left kick, she'll circle you around and hit you with that. Uh, she did a couple of good, like, intercepting left body kicks against Kaufman, but, um... Yeah, for the most part, I, I wrote in the article that she's probably the most reluctant or, or stubborn counterfighter since Anderson Silva. She's almost purely a counterfighter. She hates going forwards. And... That really hurt her in the Nunes rematch because I, I likened it to Lopez versus Lomachenko. It, it was a fight where the big hitter did some clever things to take away the finesse of the technician. But the technician got back into the fight by just engaging the hitter head on. You know, they both um, surprised each other. But it also meant that like round four and five was just them both not doing anything because they were a bit cautious. Um but rounds one, two, and three, like, Nunes really made Shevchenko's job very hard because what you saw was 
where so many people have just sort of gone after her. You know, the, the idea being like, oh, I'll overwhelm her or I'll get stuck in or you need to bite down on your mouthpiece and make something happen, which is, you know, I, I have said that from time to time. But um, yeah, they go about it in a really bad way. Like the worst one is Jessica I, who just sort of ran after her and then stopped and turned and she'd get hit in the body with a, a, a kick or, or the head later on, on the turn. Or she'd charge in and, and Valentina Shevchenko would just duck into a clinch and knock her over. That's really one of the more important things in Shevchenko's game. She's not slipping like two or three punches at a time. She slips one punch and then she clinches. You know, a lot of her game is the clinch and she gets people running onto her and picks up really easy takedowns as a result. But it's it's the difference between aggression and pressure. And what she, uh, Nunes was able to do was pressure her back. And part of that is the threat of the power. But if you watch that fight, um, Nunes does a very good job of using feints uh, and fakes which uh, Holly Holm did for about a minute in their fight. Like, the, I posted a gif the other day being like, Holly Holm, actually the hardest puncher in the women's bantamweight division, because Holly Holm drops her, uh, and which is because she caught her on one leg, because Valentina was, like, stepping up into a low kick or something. But Valentina was struggling to get her timing early, because Holly Holm does all that fainting and key eyeing and stuff. And then once she realised that Holly Holm was just going to throw the same two-punch, sorry, three-punch combination marching over and over again and key eye. Uh, she really got a read on her very quickly. But Nunes was able to use feints very, very well. And uh, basically each time Shevchenko moved back, because she's constantly doing that little shuffling backwards to correct the distance. Uh, or, uh, or, you know, she, when she corrects the distance, it is to lengthen it out and make it the wrong distance to strike. Uh, whereas when Nunes was correcting the distance, she was shuffling in. And uh, another great example of this is like, Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor, the boxing match between two great boxers. Um, but if you watch Floyd walking him down, he doesn't throw his right hand until he knows he's in position to do so. And he really tired McGregor out just by refusing to throw until he was close enough. He kept moving in, moving in, moving in. And McGregor kept having to adjust the distance. And where a lot of MMA guys would have gone, fuck it, I'm not chasing you. And then stood back out at the range that he likes. Mayweather was just like, no, nah, we're going we're gonna to keep going and making this range uncomfortable. But that's what Nunes was able to do. She was able to keep pressing in and, and to chew up the ground based off uh, Shevchenko wanting to be at that slightly too long range. And then she put her on the fence. And once she was at the fence, you know, you've got the, you've taken away the big retreats, you've taken away a lot of the ability to check her can circle off. Um, and where, when you're out in the open against Shevchenko, you've got like two options, which is one, run and swing at her head, which is what a lot of people do, or kick her lead leg, because you know that's like... After missing a few times, you know the lead leg is the closest thing, and it's the last thing to leave range. So you you step up and kick the lead leg, and that's when she does all those spinning counters because she uses it as a trigger, knowing that they're close enough. I have a good moan about that counter in uh, the article because basically, whenever she does the wheel kick or the spinning back fist, um, it's going into the closed side. Like it's really nice because the kick turns her into the into her spin, and she knows she's close enough because they're kick they're kicking her in the leg, but she'll spin for a back fist and she'll hit him in the back of the shoulder because that's just the way they're facing. Uh, if you watch her, like, um, against Jukagian, she she catches her with, like, a, a wheel kick, but just with the feet because if she were any closer, like, her calf would have hit the shoulder. Um, but she hits her... She she throws a back fist and Jake, Caitlin Jukagian clearly doesn't know it was coming and is close enough to be hit by it. And you're like, well, that would have knocked you out if that hit you on the chin or whatever. But her shoulder's in the way by accident because that's just how she's standing. Um... I'm trying to work out how you could do it better because it's a really nice trigger for a counterattack, but it doesn't work a lot of the time. The the time that it worked really well was against um, Joanna and Jacek because she stepped up into her kicks and then she like stepped back properly and squared up to step back again, do that double step back that a lot of um, traditional kickboxers do or traditional nakamue do. And she got hit in the body with the um, spinning back kick as she squared up. Uh, Paul Felder was trying to do it against Dan Hooker, and it sort of worked, except Paul Felder is... is His feet have always been very, very slow. But I really like it, leaving your lead leg out there, or, or just being very evasive and being like, oh, well, the only thing you're going to get is my lead leg. But anyway, when Nunes backed onto the fence, she was actually able to hit her in the body, hit her in the head, hit her in the legs. She could actually offer some variety, whereas typically Valentina Shevchenko is very good at limiting what you can get and then encouraging you to go for those things, and she's got counters for them. The other thing she loves to do is like when you step up for the low kick, she'll just step in, let it ride up her leg and she'll take you down. And that's the, another thing about Shevchenko that's really, um, when you say it, it sounds like being a dick, but 
she doesn't let any advantage like that go to waste. You're like if she, if you give her an easy takedown, she will sit in your closed guard for the rest of the round and win the round. You know, <laughs> that's that's just who she is. Uh, but you know, without giving away the whole article, basically the success she had against Nunes was as the was as an aggressive fighter. When she led, she could get Nunes coming back and score counters and and build up like three strikes for for one, basically in these exchanges. But um, obviously to do it against Nunez is very scary because she's a, a much bigger hitter but also it's just not who Valentina is and I wore it, and I didn't put this in the article but I, I, I'm i concerned that by making her the star of this division and feeding her these fights that don't really challenge her um, you are allowing her like to get these easy impressive wins in her own style but really like if you're her team you got to be going like fight more aggressive you know work on different stuff for this fight you know, we know you can stand back and kick the body and check hook and pick up takedowns when they run at you. Um, but what we'd really like you to see, to see you do in this fight is go forward, be aggressive and counter off their returns, you know, which is the stuff that you'd want to see her working on for Nunes. Um, but, you know, she can just keep picking up wins like this. You know, she can just keep doing the Valentina show and uh, never really work on that stuff until she fights Nunes again. And then she's got a, a hard task. Um, so yeah, that's. I mean, in the course of this, we've basically overlooked Jennifer Meyer, but from what I've seen of her, ah, man, I know she's big, you know, she's missed weight a couple of times, but, um, I, I watched her armbar, Jojo, uh, who did I watch her again? Oh, was it Alexis Davis? I watched her again, but basically her striking is bounce, 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 bound around the ring, very obviously stop, set your feet, and then step in with a one-two, and I'm just watching that going... She's gonna eat you up if you do that. <laughs> you know, if, if every time when you watch someone who's good at using lateral movement and moving around, like uh, extreme example, Sugar Ray Leonard, but maybe someone like a Dominic Cruz in MMA um, or an Eddie Alvarez. Hey, always big enough, Eddie Alvarez is ring craft on this show. But you know, think of someone who moves well and and strikes off it. They're very. They typically. Even if their moving stance is different to their striking stance, or Muhammad Ali, another great example, you know, moved around with his feet level, but dropped into his stance before he jabbed. But they hide it very well, you know. Whereas a lot of these people are like dancing around the ring, and then they're going, Hup! you know, <laughs> like like getting ready to to fight, putting putting your dukes up and bowing to your sensei and getting ready to go, which wasn't very promising. I mean, I. If she can get some takedowns, that'd be very interesting. I think you know, tr tricky to do if you're not pushing her to the fence. Valentina also very strong in the clinch um, and t has really good at that sort of like tie style of knocking people over just when they pick up their knee to knee you, you and just, just tip them over their standing leg. Um, but what I have noticed from Valentina is that on the bottom, she tends to rely on what's called, it's sometimes called the ghost escape, sometimes called the um, back door, you know, but when you, from bottom side control, you put your nearest arm to them through by their hips and you spin out it, it's um really useful in like no gi and mma and slippery settings where there's a lot of movement it's it's you know <laughs> it's asking to be paper cutter choked or bread cutter choked they call it in um jiu-jitsu uh in, in the gi but she does like really over rely on it it'd be very interesting to see someone get her down with a trip to side control or whatever, and then wait for her to do it and try a north-south choker or something like that. Or Sakuraba was trying to do it against, um, who's the Raspberry Ape? Dan Strauss. And Dan Strauss was just uh, underhooking the arm that was underhooking his his waist, and then putting his, his head side knee on Sakuraba's face, <laughs> just pitting him in place there. Um, but of course, you know, that's just stuff that you notice when you see a fighter put in a bad situation. Um, I don't know if Myers going to be competent enough to put her in a bad situation to begin with. I mean, it would be great if Jennifer Meyer came out and surprised me, um, but even for 8-1 to one odds or 15-1 to one odds or whatever they are, I'm not going to bother betting on it. You know, it's just... Um, it looks to be just another sort of like, let's get another defence under Valentina's belt. But what else is good on this card? We've got Mike Perry versus Tim Means. Now, Tim Means was a very fun guy. Well, he still is a very fun guy. He's just a little bit longer the tooth. But Mike Perry is so flawed, you know, <laughs> that maybe. Um, I think the interesting thing is that uh, Tim Means is a Southpaw and uh, Mike Perry had a lot of trouble with Danny Roberts um, back in, when was that, 2016? Fuck, he's had a lot of fights since then. But he had a lot of trouble with um, Danny Roberts and, oh, Alex Oliveira is also a Southpaw that gave him a bit of trouble. Um, 
Oh, and Jeff Neal obviously sparked him too. So yeah, actually, not looking bad for Southport Tim Means. Um, but that Danny Roberts fight was really uh, interesting because Danny Roberts would would like smash him with a, a fast left straight, which Perry would never be able to defend. And then Perry would just swing back and sometimes he'd catch him. So you really got to mind your P's and Q's with Perry because just swinging wild and hitting hard is very is, is a great base for MMA, to be honest. Obviously, the ground is always an issue for uh, Perry. So, that uh, you know, I'm not writing off Tim Means' chances. I'm just remembering that knockout loss to Nico Price, and that was sad. Um, but he hasn't had too many bad knockouts. Actually, that's the only one. <laughs> so, so there's me being like, oh, no, his chin's on the on the fritz. But it's not. <laughs> he's, he's done fine. Um, you got Caitlin Chikagian versus Cynthia Cavillo. Um Yeah. Jesus Christ. You got Mauricio Hua versus Paul Craig in a rematch of a very forgettable fight. And then the fun fun stuff you've got going on. Brandon Moreno versus Brandon Royval. Just a couple of Brandons. Royval coming off that win over Kai Kara France, which was great fun. Um, that was an uh, absolute shit show of a fight. <laughs> he, he got... Royval got dropped early and then went like knee zombie on him. He's just walking in, kneeing and getting hit in the face. But then uh, knocked him down and guillotine choked him in round two. Um, but before that, he obviously beat Tim Elliott in uh, like a last minute replacement, I think he was for that fight. But that was the one where he did an amazing job, submitted um, great grappler Tim Elliott and then was crying that he didn't get to show off his striking. <laughs> You're like, well, calm down. Um, but Brandon Moreno, been a force in the division for a while. Uh, he's on a three fight winning streak. He also beat Kai Kara France and he beat Juicy F. Omega a little while ago. When was that? That was back in March. Back when things looked okay. <laughs> back when it was normal. Um, so yeah, good fun fight. Uh, Brandon Moreno, strong grappler, but good striker. Whereas Brandon Royvale, uh, I mean, he, he did outgrapple Tim Elliott, but he's mainly, he insists he's a striker and he does fight like a fucking wild man. So I am very much looking forward to that. Um, and that's Flyweight again. So, you know, Flyweight may steal the card. Then you've got Joaquin Buck, uh, Buckley versus Jordan Wright. Uh, Joaquin Buckley is obviously riding on the momentum of a big knockout win, the coolest knockout ever, possibly. But I saw people after that being like, damn, he's going to be a force in the division. <laughs> like, I literally watched this guy unable to touch Kevin Holland about a month before this fight. <laughs> let's, let's temper our expectations a little bit. Then you've got Antonina Shevchenko versus Ariane Lipsky, uh, uh, Ariana Lipsky for fairly good looking girl who's not that great at fighting title. And then you've got Nicholas Dalby, my, my boy. Dalby versus Daniel Rodriguez. Alan Juban is on the fight, is on the card, or Alan Joban. Um, and yeah, that's basically your lot. But I wanted to get in and have a chat about them before uh, shit kicks off. Let's do a quick question, and then I'll uh, get out of here for this week. What's well, good, Slacky? I was sparring the other day, and whilst experimenting, I found myself shifting from a traditional kickboxing stance to a boxing stance. My sparring partner booted my lead leg a couple of times and told me how a boxing stance would only lead to more leg attacks. Being a contrarian, I continued on in a boxing stance. Instead, I started trying to check the lead leg attacks and then counter with a jab or a shifting right straight. I had mild success, but it got me wondering about good examples of using kick checks as a mean, means of landing counter strikes or even counter takedowns slash clinches. Do you know of any? Uh, your Patreon boy, Mac. P.S. As a fan of sentence structure and point making, I'm curious what authors slash books do you consider to be examples of good writing? Um, oh, I don't think anyone follows me for my writing ability. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, I, I'm a fan of um, Hemingway's stuff, you know, using ands instead of commas. But uh, he was heavily inspired by W.C. Is it W.C. Hines? Wrote The Professional, which is a book about a boxer and uh, Hemingway famously said that that was like the style that he was going for uh, this guy Hines had done it right big fan of Bill Bryson actually but Bill Bryson is probably my favorite person to to read as like their voice but mainly because I love uh, non-fiction like I don't never really cared for Hemingway's fiction always enjoyed A Movable Feast which I think is a fantastic book Norman Mailer is like a little bit wordy, but some of his stuff's really good. Um, like his work in the fight is pretty great, if a little bit like... Sometimes he gets a bit up his own ass, but um, that's the business of writing anyway. Like if you ever read any of these things that have been uh, nominated for 
sports writing prizes. They're all so wanky. And you know that as the person's writing them, they're going, does that sound cool or does that sound wanky? Because I've done it too. You know, you write something and you go, I might get a little bit more, you know, artsy in this one. And sometimes it comes out cool. And then you'll read it on another day and go, oh, that was pretty wanky. Um, but yeah, those are a couple of my favourites. I'm working on reading Dostoevsky in the rush. <laughs> um, Trying to think now, because a lot of things that I've re read recently have been like translations like um, Yukio Mishima and things like that. Um, or uh, I will get back to you on that, Mac. But checking kicks and, and um, baiting kicks and things like that. Right, getting in off kicks. Um, I, I think you're probably best to look at uh, shorter uh, Nakmoi. You know, people are going to be dealing with kicks a lot and have to close off them. So... Um, Hate to say Sancho again, but he's probably the best example of everything <laughs> for, for a shorter fighter. Um, I'm trying to think. Mike Zambides used to be pretty good um, at, at getting in on longer opponents who were trying to kick and keep him at, him at range. But then again, you know, when he met someone like Borkow or um, Basato, he couldn't. Um, Borkow is a, is a great example, actually, of someone who, while his uh, kicking game is like his main method of, of beating people up at range, he was very good at when kick came back catching them or checking them and moving in straight off them. Um, but on the idea of like hanging your leg out there as bait, uh, some interesting ideas from like San Shao or Sander, where uh, they use the side kick a lot, the D side particularly, um, which is just like picking the leg up and putting it on the opponent. Like uh, they call it the D side because it's a defensive side kick, but you see that in point fighting a lot too. But it's very useful uh, against kickers because if you do present that side on stance you've got your, your turning back kick your spinning kicks you've got your power side kick if you step up into it you know, you've got a nice jab but you are presenting that lead leg so you have to have an answer for it so a d side is, is a pretty good answer uh, but you know just this episode we were talking about using low kicks to turn into spinning kicks uh, and i think that would probably work well on the orthodox side if you take the outside low kick from the right leg and you turn into the back kick um you've got a better and the hook kick or sorry the wheel kick and the spinning back fist you've got a better line because you're coming into the open side rather than the closed side uh, which is what Shevchenko is doing because she's southpaw versus orthodox fighters also if you, you know, if you like pissing people off just get good at checking kicks and um, throwing like oblique kicks and teeps off the same leg because <laughs> nothing annoys people more than that cheers Mac Hi Jack, greetings from the Steel City. I have wa been wondering about the importance of being a black belt in BJJ. If someone like Anthony Pettis, brackets a purple belt at the time, can submit Benson Henderson, brackets black belt, and Cub Swanson, brackets black belt, uh, but can be submitted by Max Holloway, brackets purple belt, uh, surely with the time spent in BJJ by both Cub and Benson, they would have rolled with better submission artists. Uh, would you say this is down to Holloway and Pettis being taught by a better BJJ coach, or purely fight situations? Uh, also, does this render the BJJ belt system fairly useless? Cheers from James. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, the belt, belt stuff is always interesting because uh, the belts serve two purposes. One is, uh, like, to level the competition, as in, like, you know, you could... Com oh, who's that amazing Chinese sandbagger? He, he's, he's got, like, a really detailed background in sambo and judo, and he just... Turn, he's been a blue belt in BJJ forever. He turns up to Chinese BJJ competitions and just slams people on their heads. Um, ab absolute cunt. But um, yeah, he's uh, Rustam something rather, I think. Can't remember, but yeah. It's to stop that. Basically, if you win the Worlds at blue belt, you're pretty much going to have to go up to purple belt. <laughs> you, know, you can't just be blue belt forever. Um that's one means of using the belt. But the other one, like the entire reason it was brought in in the first place in judo was to mark progress. You know, you used to just have the black belt and the white belt. The black belt was someone who you felt was good enough that you'd say, like, he he can teach my system or he can teach these techniques and stuff. And you gave him the black belt to, to show that they passed it. And maybe like a certificate or something too, you know, reading with your own hand, just be like, this is my student, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the same with true karate. But um, Kano decided that, you, you know, belts are good for people to aim at because if you were a white belt and you had to train for five years and then you got a black belt you know, it's, it's not very um conducive to bringing in lots of students and keeping them so belts add that nice like in betweeny stuff and um it was jigoro kano who of judo who brought gichin funakoshi to the mainland saw him teach karate was like you should get some gears and some belts on that and then they added that to karate and obviously karate into taekwondo and um, that's how the belt system sort of came up and now you've got people doing it in muay thai uh, and traditionalists being very uh, against that um 
Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Like, there are black belts in um, gyms around the world in BJJ because a black belt in BJJ I, is, is still very, very hard to get. You know, like a traditional martial arts, like a judo less so, but like traditional martial arts like karate, taekwondo, things like that, you can get black belts of all different degrees. Like some people would have to work really hard and get a black belt and you go, oh, fuck, that's pretty good. But other people, you know, like got their black belt at age seven or whatever. Um, and that's just part of the trying to open up martial arts to everyone. You can't keep them at brown belt forever or, you know, can't, can't say, okay, you got your brown belt at age 10 or whatever. Now wait until you're 18 and then we'll make you a black belt or whatever. So, I mean, that's the sort of downfall of, of trying to make martial arts accept, uh, accessible to everyone. But... In BJJ, you basically don't get a black belt unless you are pretty good at jiu-jitsu. But you still are, like, if you get a black belt, you know, dudes get black belts at, like, 40, 50. And it's by hanging around, being there for a long time and learning and getting better. But some guy can still come in and, like, within a year be good enough to be, like, world's white belt champion. And they can smash a lot of black belts in a lot of gyms around the world because it's a physical sport, you know. It's, it, there's a lot more to it than just knowing what to do. I think with the black belt, with, with the belt stuff generally, like, don't take, I certainly stopped taking it as a measure of people's ability in um, MMA a long time ago. Because, you know, the, um, Randy Couture got Neil Melanson's own black belt for the system that he made up himself. And you're like, I don't know what that is. That's more uh, a training partner giving his friend this belt to say, look, thanks, I think you've mastered everything. I can teach you or whatever. Um but yeah, there's all sorts of people coming to MMA and they go black belt in so and so, and then they end up getting hit and turning their back and getting choked out. And uh, obviously, don't overlook that. Getting hit changes everything. Because I think the the Pettis one, Benson took him down off being kicked in the body twice, like really flush in the gut sort of stuff. Um, so that you know that is always uh, an issue. Um, like Max Holloway when he subbed um, both, did he sub Pettis? I can't remember. He certainly hurt Pettis with a back kick to the body before the end of that fight. Um, but he subbed Cub Swanson off hurting him too. You know, it's submissions are finishing holds. And there's a lot more like grappling skill goes into finishing someone when you can't hit them legally. <laughs> Whereas, um, you know, submitting someone that you've already punched in the face is, is a lot different. So, yeah, I would say don't look too much into that. When, when I would look into like the, the times it would matter to me is if someone said like, uh, they've competed, you know, if someone was a world champion at Purple Belt or something like that, I'd want to know that. But um, generally, no, I wouldn't say it's a great indication of fighting ability, it's particularly be because of the difference between BJJ and MMA altogether. You know, like I was just watching last night, Yuri Samosh made his MMA debut in um, one. And Yuri Samosh, of all the people in jiu-jitsu, I'd have been like, yeah, he's probably a good shout to, to transfer over because he's a, a no-gi. Well, he's been great in the gi and no-gi, but he's been very notable for the fact that he's very good at wrestling. He gets guys down. And that's true in like ADCC as well, when he's facing actual wrestlers, uh, as well as just uh, grapplers. Um, but then he came in and like he couldn't do anything to this guy who was fighting. And it wasn't a particularly notable guy either. So, um, yeah, the, the context changes everything. The context of like professional fist fighting, that is. Cheers, James. Right, I reckon that'll do us for today. I will be back on Monday to chat about these fights. I hope they're good. I hope I hope we get a good fight out of Figueiredo Perez and a good... I can't see Moreno versus Royval being bad. And then the winner of that gets presumably the next title shot. So you've got something to be excited for. I, I like that. I've always been a big believer that you want to be trying to set up something down the road for whoever wins your title fight at the top of the card. Yeah, that's why I was always like, get get Habib and Tony on these fucking McGregor cards or whatever when they were doing title fights and stuff. Yeah, so <laughs> I will chat to you on Monday. Uh, if you want to read the Valentina Shevchenko Curse of the Counterfighter or Counterfighter's Curse, that sounded more like a Scooby-Doo movie. The Counterfighter's Curse, go read it. It's a Patreon piece. Um, support the podcast. Help me pay back this fucking microphone. And... Uh, if you want to send an email to podcast, fight's gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to read what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Jennifer Meyer's wild right hand. Blessed.